Suzanne Thompson with Pollinate Old Lime. We appreciate you coming in this evening with us. I mean, what else are you going to do in weather in a day like today? If we mentioned this will be hopefully uh, shown on replay on Pollinate Old Lime YouTube channel. So we are recording it. Everyone's muted for now. Uh, we have your cameras on, but you can choose to stop your camera at any time that you want to. We'll just keep letting a few more people in the room here. So as, and we have Joe Atwater with us as well. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Atwater, a teacher naturalist with the Roger Tory Peterson Estuary Center. But, so as today's weather has shown us, mid-March in Connecticut is not exactly gardening season. I think it is, this time of year is best described as compost flipping season. While we're waiting for the soils to warm up, we don't wanna be mucking up our garden beds, but it's a good time, especially on a day like today, to do some online research as well as looking in garden books or nature books. So that's the deep dive that we're going to be doing now as you do some planning and hopefully getting outdoors more in April, May, and June. So pollinate old lime, hopefully, is part of the Sustainable Old Lime Initiative or effort. Last year, the town of Old Lime received bronze certification for its sustainability activities that it reported uh, to Sustainable CT. And this year we're going for silver. And one of the things that we're doing to earn some more points and make our community more livable and enjoyable and more sustainable is to encourage people to plant pollinator pathways support pollinators in their own backyards, as well as in the open space that we have here in this town. You don't have to be a gardener, have a green thumb to participate in this effort. You can join in just sharing the information and learning with us. We will be doing a number of webinars, demonstrations, can't wait to get together in person with people. Hopefully there'll be some plant sales and things going on that we can help promote and show up at. And uh, we many times tonight, we're going to be referring to Pollinator Pathways. It's pollinator-pathway.org. It's a wonderful website and a resource that all of the different pollinator pathway organizations in not only Connecticut, but New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, other states are all chiming in on and being a part of that. And it's a great resource to use. So the question is, what does it mean to make your yard more pollinator friendly? Uh, there's some basic steps. We want to get rid of invasive plants or at least control them, combat them. Uh, and a great information source for doing that is this brochure you see here up in the corner here. This is put out by the Connecticut, Con Co Connecticut River Coastal Conservation District. Uh, lime and old lime are in the Connecticut River Coastal Conservation District. This brochure is online on their website. They just updated it with four more invasive plants. So if you have an old copy uh, that you picked up at a past fair or library or something, there's been a few more plants added to it. But it's great information on identifying the invasive plants and steps to take control of them, as well as um, mechanical control of them and plants, native plants to plant in their place. The whole point of having a pollinator area in your yard is to provide season long food and shelter for both pollinating insects and the insects that feed the birds that depend on them. And of course, birds, bats, other wildlife are pollinators in their own right. And they're all part of the ecosystem that we want to support. A part of that is to rethink your lawn, perhaps make it smaller, add clover to the grass. If you have a shaded portion of your lawn that moss regularly grows there, please don't try to control it. That's natural. <laughs> Just let it go, it's, it's good. And a part of that as well is to avoid using chemical pesticides. We know from the standpoint that insecticides generally kill all insects, the good ones with the bad ones. And a lot of your herbicides, even though they work on plants, there are non-target species that are impacted by them as well. So the idea is to make it more natural and to plant the things that would normally grow here anyway, beat back the invasives and all of us are gonna be healthier and better for it. 
So the question is, we're going in the wrong direction. Where do we figure out what grows here? And this is what led us to doing this presentation was I've been seeing all this information about um, plant pollinators, plant native plants. And I'm like, how in the world do we tell people how to do that? There is a plethora of good, credible databases and information sources for you. I've featured a few of them here. Uh, you're going to hear more about the Audubon's plant database in a few minutes from Joe, but there is also um, the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder. Both of those are based on the zip code. And that's where I was like, aha, I don't have to worry about what USDA zone I'm in. I don't have to worry about what eco region I'm in. That's interesting. And I want to know and understand that. But if I plug in my zip code and just start going through the alphabet and see what is there that's going to grow in our backyard. So the presentation you're going to see tonight is everything that would grow, can grow here is a native plant um, in 06371. Of course, Doug Tallamy, the University of Delaware professor, is really leading the cause in a lot of good presentations on pollinator pathways and the importance of having diverse ecosystems, native ecosystems in our backyards. If you want to take a deep botany dive, Go Botany has been around for a number of years, and that's a plant ID website with a lot more information ab about the plants and the botany behind them. So that'll help you identify plants that you're looking at. USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service plant database also is good from the standpoint that it shows the maps of both native plants and invasive plants, where they came from in other parts of the world. So that, that's kind of the, the, the tome, uh, the authority, the information from USDA. And if you're into bugs, then Yukon, I encourage you to take a look at Bug Week is coming up in July, 2021. There's a lot of good information on identifying bugs there. So we have other resources as well that will help us figure out. We actually already have a number of pollinator and native plantings around the town of Old Lyme. One of the things that pollinator pathways, they encourage towns to do more of that in town properties. Well, we already have some that are underway. That includes up here, upper left-hand corner is the Old Lyme Police Department or station across from Soundview Beach. Duck River Garden Club converted a flower bed there that was overgrown with all sorts of things to a native plant garden around the flagpole. In addition to that, in the cross lane area where the voting polls are or have been, the cross lane playground has been revamped and rebuilt, a very nice facility there. Next to it is a wildflower garden that was put in about two years ago, thanks to a donation, a generous donation of someone in memoriam. And Duck River Garden Club helped with the planting of that as well. That's a great example. Like the police station shows what grows in a sunny, brutal area, tough there with a lot of wind. Um, the cross lane playground is a shaded, boggy area. So if your yard is one of those conditions, go, go take an eye at these places and see what's growing there. Of course, we have beautiful examples at the Florence Griswold Museum. The historic gardens are a mixture of traditional plants that might have been grown there in the 20s and 30s, as, including a number of native plants. And they just installed in the last year or so the Artist Trail, which is a native plantings area. Um, we have over here a buffer garden. I don't know if, if many of you know that it exists at Rogers Lake. The Old Lyme Conservation Commission volunteers had planted that in past years. A riparian buffer or a barrier garden. It's still filled with native plants. So it is a pollinator garden as well. And we're in the process at Lyme Art Association through the Nip the Knotweed project, unleashing some of the native plants that are still there if we can control and cut back the Japanese knotweed. So we'll talk more about some of these places in the coming summer and we'll put more educational signs up at them so you know what you're actually looking at as plants. Whoops, now Joe, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I apologize, I'm, my mouse is not functioning the way I want it to. 
Please, yeah. Joe, explain to us the Audubon Native Plant Database. Yeah, sure. So if you're uh, if you're a birder like I am, or you know if you if you have less of a green thumb like I do, uh, and you're really interested in planting native plants to attract birds, the Audubon Native Plant Database makes that really easy. And it's as, as Suzanne mentioned, you simply put your zip code in and your email, and it brings up this list of recommendations similar to what you see on the left here. Um, and it's really great. You can narrow it down based on which species you want to see. So let's say you want to focus on attracting wood warblers or woodpeckers to your yard. Uh, you can even search by, you know, uh, keyword, uh, you know, the different types of um, attributes, things like that. So it's a really easy um, database to use to focus on birds, you know, and, and that's a, a good way to start too. If you're a birder and you, you don't know which plants, there's a lot of plants out there, you know you want to attract birds. This is a really easy way. Um, and it, it does a, you know, a very narrow search initially, but then it can also do a broad search with hundreds of different plants. Um, so this is a great way to kind of uh, dial back down, you know, what you're looking for and kind of focus in. And, and especially this time of year when we're almost in spring migration where we'll get birds like the, um, the scarlet tanager on the right there and black pole warblers, these birds that are coming through and really need our help. Uh, they're making long distance migrations. And so our native plant um, gardens and, and native pollinator gardens are really pivotal for them, for their survival uh, during the breeding season. So really, really wonderful database and really easy tool to use for anybody. Highly recommend it. So now, Joe, can you actually buy plants there if a person clicked on the buy now? What is that? You know? I, you know, I've never actually uh, hit the buy now. It's a good question. I, I haven't <laughs> bought them from the website, but you, you can create your own plant list there. You see the add to your plant list. Uh, I'm not sure what that brings you to. It's a good question. Uh, okay. I don't know if it connects you to local nurseries or what. I, I do recommend, you know, trying to use local Connecticut uh, businesses as well, but that's a good question. I haven't, I haven't hit the buy now. I haven't. Okay. Uh, we will mention a few plant sales that we know about upcoming later in the presentation. So now we're going to run through the alphabet. And again, this was just kind of the fun in the shower. I was like, oh my gosh, in Connecticut, it's got to be A for asters, but A could be for Agastache just as well. So you can, you can pick the plant that's going to work for your yard and your setting, your liking. But there's nothing more quintessential New England than the New England aster. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Latin name on this. These will be blooming in August, September, October at the Old Lyme Police Department, right around the flagpole. The challenging thing about these New England asters is they can get up to six feet tall. So if, if that's taller than what you wanted or intended, you pinch the plant back before mid-July. If you pick and pinch it back after that, you're destroying the blooming cycle, but you can kind of shorten the back a little bit in that May, June timeframe. And they'll still bloom, but they'll be a little bit more compact or shorter. Or you could look for a, a different variety uh, of aster. And there are a lot of native asters around. I just happen to notice this pretty little white wood aster in front of the Phoebe Griffin Noise Library a year or so ago. So of course I had to just stop and take a picture. But, but asters are, are very important in terms of being one of those late pollinator insects in the year. Uh, when monarchs are coming through, the adults will feed on the nectar along with other butterflies that are getting ready to, to migrate. And so you wanna have a full season of blooms. So we'll start with A for aster as a late bloomer and a real New England plant. I'm gonna jump to a tree here birches or betula. I think a lot of times we think of a white birch and many of the white birch trees that we see may not be native. That might be Himalayan or Japanese birch and they might have a lot of birch borer problems. Birch trees might not live a, as long as some other trees, especially if they're not a native species. But the dwarf river birch or betula nigra is a good, sturdy, longer living birch that tends to not have the borer insect problems. You can also see some examples of it on the Yale Nature Walk website. That's a fun website to go to and you'll see pictures uh, of different trees around on the Yale campus. Joe, talk about some of the birds that like. Yeah, birds. so I have a picture of uh, this beautiful little common red pole here. Uh, and some of you may have been lucky enough to see this bird this winter. Uh, they're an eruptive species, so their populations fluctuate year to year, depending on food sources. 
Uh, and one of common red poles favorite food are birch trees. They love eating the catkins off of birch trees. So if you're interested in attracting these little finches to your yard, planting birch trees in them is a great way to increase your chances of seeing these, um, these little birds uh, during the winter time. We had a really good winter this past year for common red poles, evening grosbeaks, a lot of these birds that are further north. So uh, if you want to increase your chances of, of attracting common red poles to your yard, birch trees are a great way to do that. Um, every time I've seen a red pole uh, or a group of red poles, they've been on birch trees. So they love that. Um, and a lot of birds rely on um, birch trees for food and for, for nesting as well. Hmm. Okay, you can see this is a dwarf tree. So they do come in smaller sizes as well. C is for Coreopsis or tick seed. And usually you think of that as a yellow flower. This has been a very popular uh, cultivar here, the one with the picture with the butterfly on it. Now you'll notice tonight, we're not getting all stressed out about cultivars or not. I mean, gen there many of the native plants have had cultivars developed. That's, that's where humans breed them, select them to be slightly different. And they call them nativars as well. S tests are being done, studies are being done. Sometimes they attract as many pollinators uh, as the straight plant. Sometimes they don't, but we're not, you know, we're not going to say, no, you must always grow the straight because you, the straight species, because you might want a different color in your yard. That the idea is go as native as you can, try to stick closest to the core shape of those flowers and plants. Um, because then you still have the pollen and the nectar that are there. And it's going to be really fascinating to see what research done over time, I think you will see more native bars being developed with assessing their pollinator criteria as well. You, you know, you get what you measure for. And in the past, if we weren't measuring for changing of breeding, if it affected the ecosystem or the pollinators or not. But tick seeds, very easy to grow. Um, it can handle some tough growing situations in full sun. Joe, what do we do with the flowers though, once they've bloomed? Uh, well, we, if you don't deadhead them, um, that leaves seeds for, for birds like these beautiful indigo buntings, uh, as well as finch species and other birds that love seeds. So uh, tick seed is one of those seeds, uh, seed plants that will provide food, especially later in the season for a lot of these birds. So Again, another really beautiful bird that, you know, another reason to, to, to leave these plants later in the season to attract these beautiful indigo buntings. But unless work for the gardener, you don't have to yes. keep deadheading. And also they will reseed. So you don't want to cut off the seeds either. D is for dogwood or the cornice genus. And I think we classically think certainly in Appalachia of cornice Florida um, or the traditional dogwood tree. I mean, and there's a pink variety. That's kind of cool too. Those have some disease problems and they don't do quite as well up here in New England, but there are so many other good dogwoods that we can choose like silky dogwood, which will have white flowers and so will gray dogwood. And the, I really like the um, red osier dogwood, the Cornus sericea. That's the one that you're going to be seeing now with these bright red stems sticking up. It's cool all the way across the yard. If you've got them on a border or something, you'll really see the pretty color then. And they will have pretty leaf color in the fall. What's the importance to birds, Joe, of dogwood? Yeah. Dogwoods are a, a huge favorite of birds. Uh, you'll get a lot of birds on dogwood uh, plants, dogwood trees, uh, especially warblers. You know, in the next couple of months, we'll get a bunch of warblers coming through and into the state and warblers love dogwood trees. So that's another one. If you want to attract warblers to your yard, like that beautiful pine warbler, uh, you know, plant dogwoods. Uh, and red osier dogwood is a huge favorite among a lot of warbler species. Okay, now one dogwood we want to resist planting is one we probably all have in our yard is the Coosa dogwood. That's not a native species. It's known for its big white flowers that come out about two weeks later than the Cornus Florida and it has red berries in the fall. Those don't support any of our native birds and species. Um, they're, they're not from here, and so they don't support the ecosystem here. But most of us have one in our yards, so don't plant any more of them, please, okay? 
E is for echinacea, which actually is not, uh, you were familiar from, as a medicinal herb. Uh, you might have a bottle of echinacea in, in your house to take to support your immune system. It's actually not a native New England plant. It is more of a Midwestern prairie plains plant, but it is adapted well in New England and it's popular uh, with many people. Uh, the traditional classic colors are the pinky purple that you see here. There's been a lot of breeding done with different colors as well. Uh, we have some, we planted some at the Cross Lane Playground and they are doing nicely there and will be spreading more every year. How do they fit in with the birds? And yeah, this is another one that you don't want to deadhead uh, because the seeds are really great for birds like the American goldfinch, those indigo buntings again, any of those seed eating birds uh, will love the seeds of the echinacea. So it's another one that less work for you. You don't have to cut those heads off and it's great for the birds too, especially later in the season. Um, again, oftentimes in the late season like this, uh, or, you know, later in the season, birds need more food, they're getting ready to migrate, any amount of food you can provide them is really, really helpful. So now this is one of the plants where they've done a lot of the studies about, uh, do you want to stay with the straight one or not? And if you go to the Mount Cuba Center website, Mount Cuba is in near Wilmington, Delaware, you'll find their studies that they have done. Or you can listen to Margaret Roach's podcast. If any of you are familiar with A Way to Garden, that's it's her website. Margaret used to work for Martha Stewart Magazine and she's gardening in her own property and has a very entertaining website and podcast series. So F is for Fragaria <laughs> or the common wild strawberry. I'm particularly frustrated that I haven't come across or discovered a lot of native ground covers. Uh, of course, we all have Pachysandra, Ajuga, maybe some European ginger. There is American ginger. There is an American Pachysandra, but I'm not sure I would recognize it. But I am experimenting with wild strawberry. I planted some last year and it's just beginning to come back now. Um, but it will bear fruit as well. But it's something that you can just kind of let it go in an area. It tillers and runners around. And uh, if anybody has other uh, good ideas for native ground covers, I want to hear them because I think we need to come up with something beyond Pachysandra. So where do, the, where do the birds fit in on this, Joe? Yeah, so any of those birds that love berries, you know, American robins and other thrush species, uh, cedar waxwings, uh, wild turkeys love uh, common wild strawberry as well. So if you've got some wild turkeys in your yard, this will bring them in as well. Uh, so any of those berry eating birds, uh, and a lot of these, a lot of birds do switch to berries later in the season as well uh, as insects become less common. So um, any of those berry loving birds will, and, and I, I believe, I don't know if humans can eat the, the, the strawberries. They're not particularly large, if I remember correctly for these. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so <laughs> not particularly edible for us, but the birds do love them. Good, good. That's, you know, one thing I read somewhere that birds are basically on a caterpillar diet in the spring. That's about yes. caterpillars and spiders. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Spiders provide really important nutrients for uh, chicks, for fledglings. Really? Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, this is the fascinating thing I find <laughs> out as a gardener. We all hang out and talk about flower color and does it grow in sun or shade? And if I get together with a bunch of birders and, and nature types, they talk a whole different language about the same <laughs> plants. So, so this, yeah. this is why we do this. So here is another ground cover, um, the geranium or the wild geranium, natural geranium. And it definitely is important for bees. And that little bee that you see there is a solitary minor bee. So um, not of age, but minor of digging, mining. And, you know, we the, the European honeybee has become kind of the poster bee to be protected. And it, it is very important, but there are so many single solitary bees and wasps and sweat bees that are coming out at all different times of the year and have a crucial role to play. We probably don't see them, or we, we just think they're a little buzzing insect, but they're very important and they, they need flowers at different times of the year. 
I think so, Connecticut has over a hundred bee species. Is that, I think approximately? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was the wildflower of the year of the Virginia Native Plant Society. So I don't know if it's won any awards in Connecticut, but that's one to be looking for. H is for Hamemelis or witch hazel, which has a historic significance in Connecticut anyway, from the Dickinson witch hazel factory uh, in the town of Essex. And there's still some signs of that still there. What birds does the witch hazel attract, Joe? Yeah, so witch hazel uh, tends to come out a little later in the season. So this is another one that's really helpful for birds uh, later into the fall and into early winter. Um, you know, as Suzanne mentioned earlier, you want to, you know, have something available for the pollinators, for insects, for birds all year round. It's about creating a habitat year round. And witch hazel is great for later in the season. For uh, yellow rumped warblers are one of our few overwintering warblers here in Connecticut, uh, and as well as some of those later uh, migrating warblers like Tennessee and, and some of our ones that head down south a little later, witch hazel provides some really important food later in the season. So instead of thinking about yellow forsythia being the first in the spring, we need to be thinking about witch hazel being the last yellow bloom mm -hmm. late in the winter. So, and that's something else. We all have forsythia and, and that's not native either. So there are native options and alternatives to add some interest at different times of year in your yard. So we see those little yellow rump warblers or we see them in our bird feeders over the winter? Um, they tend to eat more berries in the winter time. So they'll go after holly and uh, wax berries and bay berries. Uh, not, not quite as much the seeds. It's not you know impossible to see them out there, but they're feeding primarily on uh, any fruit that's available in the winter time. Okay, so hollies, bayberries, waxberries. Again, these are different berries that we can look for to replace euonymus, let's say. Or here's another berry, that the yeah. inkberry, which I don't really see the berries so much on these in my property, but I do see the little white flowers on the inkberry in the early summer. And you, they can grow pretty ranging and tall. You can have some success cutting them back and getting them to flush back out as a plant. These uh, are about 10 years old used in a border. And I'm in the process of redesigning the border. So that's why it looks like a mess. But uh, the Alex Glabra is pretty forgiving. It can take sun and shade. And I think a lot of people go, ah, you know, it's not a very special type of, of ink berry of holly, but, but it works well and we could use more of it in our landscapes. And you were saying before the program started, cedar wax wings are quiet. They yeah, don't, they, don't tend, they don't really have much of a song. They kind of have a high pitch, almost a very high pitch trill. Uh, it's, it's not really a, a song, but it's, you, you can tell when they're there and there's usually a number of them. So they, they make this very high pitch kind of racket when they're nearby. Uh, and they the love berries. the berries. Uh, just be aware that they will sometimes, uh, if they have fermented berries, they've been known to fly into windows. So if you do have <laughs> windows nearby, put up some decals on there if you've got berry bushes and that'll help save the, the cedar wax wings too. Maybe that's why I don't ever see the berries because I have cedar wax wings in my yeah. neighborhood. <laughs> they, they get to the berries first for me. Okay. Yeah. So Jay, it's Joe Pie and I can't call it a weed. Even though we all call it Joe Pie weed, it's really not a weed. Um, it had been called Eupatorium, but now they changed the Latin name to Eutrochium. But this is another, this plant you will see along riversides, riverbeds, it likes to grow near the water. And depending on the more sun you get, the more flowers you get, the more bees you're going to get. There's a number of, uh, I'm not sure if those are honeybees or bumblebees here. Um, but this is the traditional straight species. There's also a chocolate eupatorium, which is a con it's cousin of Joe Pie. I ordered it, oh, about 10 years ago. And it's a very short, low plant with white flowers. And I definitely see insect holes on the leaves. Um, it's not skeletonized or anything. So something is eating it and enjoying it. But this is definitely one of your August bloomers. 
and important for extending um, the season. Do you, oh, does this bring Orioles? Orioles? Yes, yeah, Orioles, Buntings, Vireos. Uh, Joe Pieweed's another really good one for a lot of bird species as well. Um, so, you know, again, if you wanna attract some of those really beautiful, uh, and the Orioles will be around through August, they do breed in Connecticut. So uh, as Suzanne mentioned though, they will be focusing primarily on insects and caterpillars during the breeding season. Um, but, you know, especially later in the season, they'll go after the Joe Pieweed, especially uh, a huh. big bird favorite, the Joe Pieweed. Okay, that it's a good plant. Now, I do use some deer spray on mine. I, uh, it, they found it, but I, but I live between a forest and a marsh, <laughs> an old line like a lot of people do. So uh, deer are a constant problem. And when you do plant anything, whether it's native or non-native, even if it says deer tolerant, so deer's gonna try to eat some new growth to it. So I would recommend that you go ahead and spray some stinky spray whenever you're planting things and you're training them away from an area. Um, but we recognize and we're all frustrated with dealing with the deer. They're the one wildlife we don't wanna feed that much. <laughs> But we do want to provide resources for all of the other wildlife that we need and want and have. So K is for Calmia, the mountain laurel. This is the state flower. And uh, it's going to be beautiful in June. How does that fare with the birds? Is that a, more of a bird or a pollinator? Yeah, so the... The flowers are a little small for you know hummingbirds and, and for uh, they don't really provide seeds, but they they do grow fairly dense. So some birds do like to nest within the um, the mountain laurel branches. I, I think hooded warblers are one that really like uh, mountain laurels and similar uh, species. Um, so and, and you know all these all these pollinators, anything that attracts pollinators and caterpillars is going to attract birds, especially during the breeding season. Um, but mountain laurel especially is, is good though. It gets pretty dense as you can see in this middle picture here. Uh, really good protection for, for nesting birds. Gray cat birds and some warbler species, things like that, mocking birds. And according to the National Wildlife Federation, it attracts 35 species of butterflies and moths. They use this as a caterpillar host plant. So it's definitely liked and enjoyed by uh, the butterflies and moths. Spice bush is another bush that you might find in a native setting, and it's going to smell very nice and fragrant in the spring from these little yellow flowers. It's a not it's not a real full ornamental bush, you know. So if you're looking for something that's all thick and greenery, that's not going to be the spice bush, but it would be lovely in front of some other greens. And it also like if you had a, a hillside or a stretch that you had these growing in an open space, um, you will see a, a swath of yellow color at the time that the flowers are out. So it's kind of another overlooked plant that could be used more in landscape settings. Yeah, and it does smell incredible. This, I had one in my neighborhood growing up and you could smell it down the street. It's just, it's really, really fragrant. fragrant. Uh, and, the, and the birds do love it too. Vireos and, and buntings and, and orioles, uh, you know, they're attracted to that. So it's a, it's a good one for, yeah, it's, it's not the fullest plant, but it does provide a lot of other great things for your yard. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing we're trying to get the idea that with nature, that not everything is going to look the same. You want some diversity. You want right. some tall plants. You want some open ones. You want that understory below the trees where you've got smaller trees growing or shrubs growing. So now here's a plant that I think is really catching on in the last couple of years. You hear people talking about it a lot more, mountain mint. And it, it is a mint. It does have a square stem, but it's really not an alpine mountain plant at all. It's more of that field or meadow plant. There's both the narrow leafed which um, it's kind of a rangy kind of plant with the white flowers on the top. And then there's the blunt or short tooth that has short leaves and these kind of thick flowers. And I've heard that this could be something that if you have some, a weedy area and you've cut back, pulled back, gotten rid of the weeds, go ahead and plant in mountain mint there. It could be 
a rugged barrier. Somebody called it, a gardener called it brutish. <laughs> I think she was planting it in front of her Japanese knotweed thinking it was going to help keep the Japanese knotweed at bay. I, I don't know if it really will, but it's a good workhorse plant that can, in this picture here, it's been combined with, with Joe Pye So they have the combination of the pink flowers going on with the white flowers in kind of a naturalized setting. But you will hear more people talking about mountain mint. And if you crush it, it does have that minty flavor or smell to it. So another shrub that I think doesn't get the credit it ought to is the nine bark or physocarpus. There's a couple of different varieties of color choices. You have your classic green, which is kind of a celery or a yellowish green. And then you also have this reddish pinkish one. And the flowers look like little spirea caps, like we're used to spirea flowers but so many of the spirea bushes that we have here are spirea japonica, it's, it's brought in. So it's not really supporting the native pollinators, but this obviously has an attraction for birds and insects. Are you yeah, familiar another, with it, Joe? Yeah, it's another really dense one. You know, you, you can look in this picture here in the bottom right, another one that's a really good nesting spot for um, you know, like things like gray cappers and northern mockingbirds that you know, find a lot of safety within that dense foliage. Um, American robins, you know, birds that really like to hang out deep in there that, you know, a lot of protection from larger predators and other, you know, fly, hawks and birds of prey and things like that. So okay. really good for that, definitely. Now it is deciduous, so all those leaves will disappear in the winter time, but it really bulks up and gets dense and gets pretty. The red one, that was, a, that was in front of um, Denali's, the former Denali's in Old Saybrook on Main Street. They had a whole bunch of them planted there. And it attracts these beautiful IO moths with the fuzzy caterpillars that you don't want to touch because they'll make your hands itch. So. Yeah. so ask for nine bark. We need more nine bark. So did you know there is a native prickly pear cactus in Connecticut? It can either grow in large sprawling clumps or just kind of individual plants. So you might find it popping up in a meadow setting. And particularly if you have a dry, sandy, sunny area in your yard or a rock garden area, you might wanna find these and add them too. They serve both bees and birds. Yeah, I would imagine the hummingbirds go for the blossoms there. Uh -huh. uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if some birds ate some of the fruit. There's a great, if you go to the uh, Connecticut College Arboretum, they have a uh, prickly pear growing within the conifer collection. <laughs> Which could be natural <laughs> mm -hmm. as, as we find out. So yep. most, most cactuses are from other parts of the world, but the prickly pear is native to a lot of, of North America. So be different and put a cactus in your yard. P is for penstemon digitalis or beard tongue. And these plants get nice and tall, three, four, five feet tall, put out these beautiful white bell flowers. I have a couple growing in my yard and it's nice to see how they are reseeding themselves and getting larger every year. According to the Xerxes Society, there's about 150 different species of this plant in North America and Eastern Canada. And sure enough, those tubular flowers are attractive to a lot of bees as well as hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. So you also, it's an important area, it's important for mason bees, which are above ground cavity nesters so don't scalp your yard in the fall or too early in the spring because any cuttings that are, or mulch or straw that you're removing, you're also taking insects with it, which could be some minor bees. That's, that's their homes over the winter time. So I included a picture of it in the spring as it's beginning to come out because it does kind of look like a weed. So you have to be careful if you're growing it and don't think, oh, that, I don't know what that plant is. That's gonna be this beautiful penstemon. Give it a couple months time. So the oaks are Doug Talamy's favorite 
genera or genus or family of trees. He considers them, they, they feed the most uh, caterpillars, which support the most birds in North America. So Joe, yes. what, what can you tell us about all the birds that depend on the oak uh, tree? I mean, especially in, in breeding season, you know, most birds are feeding their chicks caterpillars or, or spiders, as you mentioned. And so, yeah, I think it's well over 400 species uh, that um, oak trees support. Uh, and a chickadee may have to bring a, you know, thousands of caterpillars over the course of a couple weeks to its chick. So, you know, it, it much prefers to have an oak in your yard as opposed to something like a non-native, which may only host a couple of different caterpillar species. Mm -hmm. um, so by planting these oak trees in your yard, you're providing much better habitat for those insects. And a lot of times, you know, when you're looking to attract birds to your yard, you are really trying to attract the insects to then attract the birds. Uh, but I mean, acorns are used by some, uh, some species, uh, you know, game birds, blue jays, some birds do go after the acorns as well. But it's really those that diversity of caterpillars that's going to feed black cap chickadees and tuft of tip mouse and lots of our warbler species as well. Uh, and then obviously, you know, for their size, provide a lot of nesting site too for a lot of different bird species. Mm -hmm. So if you have room to plant an oak tree or two, go ahead and do it. It's it's well worth your time. Yeah, definitely. So here's another pretty plant when it comes to fall foliage color: Rus aromatica or fragrant sumac. Um, if you've been over in Waterford, maybe you've seen this clump over in one of their, the Waterford police station. But how do the gro blue grosbeak, where, when do they come through? Blue grosbeaks are, they're pretty uncommon in the summertime. Um, and they do look very similar to indigo buntings. Uh, and we do get, the indigo buntings will go after those as well. Um, but rose-breasted grosbeaks are a little more common in the summertime in Connecticut and they'll go after uh, the sumac as well. And sumac is another one that tends to provide food a little later in the season as well. So this is another important one uh, later in the year when there's not quite as much food available for birds. Sumac is still flowering and providing important food for you know, those last birds moving through and, and the birds coming down from, from further north as well. Okay, this one will lose its leaves in the winter time after the color is gone. And so you'll have slender delicate branches and it will tend to kind of, um, tiller out and spread out and can spread out and grow a little bit more too. So that's like a nice low bush. Whoops. And oh my gosh, how could I forget S for Solidago, the golden rods. This is another one of those keystone species. If you're going to just plant certain things, it's like make sure you include some goldenrod. And there are multiple choices of goldenrod. People accuse the Canadensis, which is the one here that took over. I like how it kind of grows in my hydrangea. It adds a touch of color. That is not the culprit that causes hay fever. Ragweed kind of looks like that, not nearly as pretty, blooms at the same time. That's what causes hay fever. So some people think that Canadensis is a little thuggish and grows where it shouldn't. But here's another variety, Seaside Golden, which has thicker leaves, bigger clumps of flowers. And you can see that on Conn College campus. So it, it, it supports both birds and bees. 500 species of different insect. No, 500 species of goldenrod, and with 11 native bee species that it supports, and 123 butterflies and moths. So goldenrods deserve more respect and being planted in more places. The tulip tree is one of the biggest trees here in Connecticut, a very fast grower. And did you take that picture of the one? In I, I did, yeah. Yeah, that's up in Essex. It's one of the largest um, tulip trees in the state. Or at one point, it, it was, it's either in the, the, the first or the top, it's in the top three or five. There's a little plaque on that tree that you can read, yeah, uh, but it's a plant. massive tulip tree. Okay. So that's going to need some space in your yard or just enjoy it in naturalized settings. Look for it. Um, Al Birchstead here, you can see holding the tulip shaped leaf and it has a very prominent flower, kind of uh, orangey yellowy that comes out in June. So it does attract silk moths. Those are gorgeous. And it's another one of the trees for warblers. 
Yeah, especially um, those warblers that like to nest higher up in trees. So cerulean warblers, Blackburnian warblers, um, some species nest 60 feet or higher up in trees and tulip trees growing, you know, well over 100 feet are a good one for a lot of those birds that nest higher up in the, uh, in the, the canopy. Uh, and their flowers are good for uh, hummingbirds as well. Okay, so this might be one to look for in a nature hike in a preserve somewhere. Yeah, Conn College has a couple of, their arboretum has a couple of really beautiful examples of tulip trees. Uh, two of my favorite trees are in the Conn College Arboretum and they're about three and a half feet in diameter. They're just absolutely massive trees. Wonderful. Now is Conn College open for tours now, even with COVID, do you know? How the Arboretum, yeah, the Arboretum is open to the public, yep. Okay, good. So bell warts, are a shade plant. If you have a shaded garden area, the grandiflora with the big yellow flowers is one that you'll see in horticultural trade. And then you'll also see other bell warts um, occurring in nature preserves and forested areas. The perfoliate or the sessile leaf bell wart. Uh, those are different ones. They tend to bloom in May or June. And they're important for a number of different insects that just kind of hanging out in the forest understory. So this is actually a picture at Conn College, one of the, the gardens that you can tour. So if you have a shaded yard and you're looking for something, oh, different than tulips, because we all know we can't grow tulips with the deer around here, um, maybe you'd like to add some, some bell warts. Viburnums. I bet we all have a Korean spice bush viburnum in our backyard. I know I have a couple, but I also have this viburnum that uh, it was native seeded. I haven't identified what it is, but it is a native one. I haven't narrowed it down to which species, but there are so many viburnums that we should consider uh, planting in our yards instead of going with the ones that we find in the horticultural trade, the maple leaf viburnum, the nannyberry viburnum, arrowwood viburnum, and the withrod. So do a little research before you go out and buy the first viburnum that you see. See if you can find a native one. Yeah, and the berries of these plants are really important for a lot of bird species like Carolina wrens and uh, thrushes and, and those waxwings again. The, the berries are really, really popular with a lot of different bird species. And they're pretty easy to grow. So, whoops, we're going the wrong way. Hold on, we are, W is, oh, I didn't want to show you Z yet, whoops. Hold on, I have a trigger finger. W is for willows. And this is another one of the keystone generous. There are so many different willows that we could be planting, whether it is the native pussy willow that looks about like this now on the left is coming out or just some other varieties of willows. Now, weeping willow is not native, the classic one that we see you know, in the pictures, but willows support eight native bee species, 377 butterflies and moths, and host 455 caterpillar species, according to Doug Talney. So look for ways to include different willows. Yeah, and there's, they're really popular with birds too. Yeah, like the yellow warbler there that tend to nest in, in wetter areas. Um, but lots of birds, you know, use uh, woodpeckers like it, it tends to have softer wood. So uh, for boring insects and, and uh, woodpeckers like it, but a lot of birds also use the, the soft material of the, the willows to line their nests with as well. So that's really important for nesting birds. Oh, okay. So we should be seeing those little willow tufts right about now and enjoying them outside. Sphinx moths are, are fun too. We did find an X, yellow root, Xanthorhiza. And I, this is one that I've not worked with in a garden setting. It's more of a ground cover. It provides shelter for doves as well as food. Yeah, so it provides some seeds for um, ground feeding birds like doves and uh, game birds, uh, as well as, as some, some shelter for them, yeah. 
Okay. One of the nice things about yellow root is, is one of these ones, uh, according to some other gardeners I've talked with, that it can go in transition areas that are part sun, sun to shade, you know, where you, you can't put something that needs full sun, yet you're not in a total shady area. So the seed heads of it, it says will maintain a lacy appearance and the flowers will carry over into winter, those pretty little red and yellow things. The roots apparently were used by Native Americans to make dye and um, medicinal effect. You could chew on the stems and the roots and they would have a numbing effect. So that's one of these overlooked plants that we probably ought to use more. Look for it and use it in our environment. Y is for yarrow, achillea, and the native colors, a straight line is more of the yellows and the whites. So the pink is probably a cultivar that has been developed. We have some pretty red ones in front of the Old Lyme Police Department. These are a full sun plant. I will say that this is a bit of a transitional plant. It won't necessarily last forever in the site that you plant it in. Kind of like Rudbeckia, uh, Black Eyed Susans. They may exist for a while and then they'll come back later, years later, say, or they'll blow in somewhere else in your yard and find a new place to grow, a better place for them to grow. So just because you planted something, um, don't expect it to always stay in the same place, which is kind of frustrating to us as gardeners, because if we want to treat our landscape like it's a bunch of statues, and statuary, and it doesn't change size and shape, then some native plants are going to disappoint us. <laughs> but they, they were here first, kind of thing, you know, and we want to bring them back. Let me, so, so experiment with yarrow, but as I say, don't be surprised if it's not there a few years from now in the same spot. Let me get back to my page here. We're down to the end of the alphabet. Z is for zizia. And uh, this is a member of the like celery or parsnip family. So it's an interesting woodland wildflower. It's gonna bloom in April to June and it grows more in wet meadows, swamps. It's a member of the carrot family actually. So here's an interesting picture at Mount Cuba where they're using it in a woodland, woodland setting with flocks. So that's a nice color contrast with them. But again, if you want to encourage black swallowtails, then look for some meadow alexanders or zizia. So that's it through the alphabet. I apologize for those technical glitches there. You know, the question is, what, you know, what do you do next? I, I hope that we've given you some ideas of different plants that you can do a little more digging and research on. The point is, you know your own yard best and you know if it's a sunny place or a shady place, if it's a dry place or boggy, uh, you want to pick plants that are suited for the area, for your little microclimate, how it's growing. One of our biggest challenges is we try to grow the wrong plant in the wrong place and we wonder why it doesn't survive and why we have to try to treat it with fertilizers and other things. Well, it just wasn't planted in the right place. So I encourage you to spend time on the Pollinator Pathway website. Probably all of the links that we mentioned here and organizations that we mentioned here are somewhere on the resources on Pollinator Pathway. When you're shopping at garden centers, another thing to do is if you ask for, look for American Beauties native plants, uh, that's, you're probably going to be finding plants that are not cultivars, that are the straight species or closer to it, um, not some bizarre cultivar that might not attract uh, the, the pollinating insects. Um, the Connecticut River Coastal Conservation District plant sale is now order open. They're taking orders through April 1. I bought the last two maple leaf viburnums last night. I hate to tell you that. And uh, I'm not gonna put it in print, but I will say watch the Duck River Garden Club Facebook page to see what they are able to do for a spring plant sale. They're checking into it now. I'm not gonna jinx it, but there could be opportunities uh, to do some more local plant shopping, native plant shopping uh, here in Old Lyme soon. And if you like, follow our Facebook page. We'll continue to post different information tell you about upcoming talks. 
And uh, we'd, we'd like to hear from you too, if you have questions or ideas on things. So Joe, I'll let you give a shout out for your upcoming spring yeah. lecture series. Yeah, so uh, we have April 8th, we have, you, you heard Suzanne mention the Xerxes Society a couple times. Well, we've got uh, Robert Pyle, who is the founder of the Xerxes Society. He'll be doing a, a, our spring, one of our spring lectures for us on April 8th. Uh, and so you can register for that for our, on our website. Uh, and he'll be talking about butterflies. So it should be a really interesting uh, conversation. Robert Powell is a pretty big name uh, in the conservation world and in, in, you know, in this space especially. So uh, you can register for that on our website. It is free uh, and it should be a, a really interesting talk. And so you can connect this, this uh, hymn to the, the Xerxes Society, which we've mentioned a couple times already. Great. So here's our contact information. Stay in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you.